honor to have today Professor Chowning Kuwam, the last name. Uh, that's a pronunciation? Kuwam? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, and he is not that stranger who was sitting here last, <laughs> last time. He, you know, he wasn't uh, some il infiltrator, but he was this uh, very thorough lecturer who wanted to maximally tune the current lecture to be um, complementary to the one that we heard on Tuesday. So it's also going to be about extremely exciting topics that have to do with information, order, and the Big Bang, and obviously a direct relevance to our science of information. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so I think and I hope this is a very intuitive uh, talk and uh, with uh, kind of surprising connections between very mundane sounding like water, hot water, cold water, the Big Bang, right? I mean, if you try to do like, that connection, um, so I'll try to convince you there is a connection. That's pretty deep and surprising, okay? Um, but the connection to this course, however, is through the concept of entropy. Uh, so entropy is a common concept, both in information theory and in physics. I'm going to talk mostly about um, entropy and physics, although the two concepts are deeply linked, okay, and analogous. And they deviate somehow, although if you're creative enough, like the theorists are, um, you may be able to find new links uh, between these two concepts. That's before finding it. This is a short summary. Um, so entropy has been used uh, in physics since the 19th century, you know, 1855 or some 1850, um, in thermodynamics, okay? And the fundamental statistics description of entropy uh, was uh, invented uh, in late 19th century. And then in early 20th century, uh, the concept was borrowed by uh, Shannon, uh, into uh, information theory, 1948, in, in, in the paper. I just read that paper for the first time a few days ago in preparation for this course. Um, it's not like the informa in information theory, entropy measures the amount of information that's not compressible, okay? So if you have a string uh, of random numbers, that means you have a lot of entropy because it's really hard to compress a string of random numbers. In fact, it's probably impossible, right? Uh, to compress a string of random numbers. So analogously, in physics, entropy is a measure of disorder, randomness. So again, a string of random number, a series of random number, is what you call a, uh, a pretty random state of things. But there's a lot of disorder, okay? And it also happens that the two formulas are identical in both physics uh, and information theory. Now, of course, before that, a bit more. Um, so this lecture, again, is about entropy and physics, something that you probably heard of. How many of you have not heard of second laws of thermodynamics? The second law of thermodynamics. So you have all heard about the second law of thermodynamics, okay? Um, and I'll briefly review that and reveal some surprising aspects of it, okay? Um, so the second law of thermodynamics says the entropy of a state should always increase, okay? And you probably know or heard, the reason for that is probabilistic because it's more <coughs> likely that this state will evolve to this state that has higher entropy because higher entropy has more probability of happening. That's probably what you heard, that's probably what you heard, okay? That's more or less true, but not quite, okay? So I'll tell you why. Um, also, on Tuesday, Patrick, my colleague at the physics department, said, um, had a very interesting claim that information is physical. Okay, so of course I asked him a question, and I still thought about it a bit more. So how can information be physical? How can your computer game uh, be real and virtual at the same time, right? So the simplest example I can come up with is if you play your computer game too much, your smartphone will heat up. Okay, duh, I mean, it's true, and it's a representation of physics, uh, physical phenomena, 
by remanipulation of the information. Okay, so this is just a realization of information processes that becomes physics, right? But you probably didn't know this. You can also cool your soda with a poem. Mm -hmm. So, do you know how to do that? So you write a poem, and it consists of one, 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 okay. Whatever, I'm gonna go in part. What are you gonna do, right? Um, and then, you just let it go. You just let it go, okay? And this state, will like to become this state, just because it's probabilistically more likely. So this is evolving to this, okay? In entropy terminology, this has more entropy than this. So the only way this can become this <coughs> is by absorb heat, by absorbing heat. So this is an elect electronic spin state of atoms. And um, how do you write this poem? You, in fact, you, you do it by cheating. You apply a giant magnetic field, an intense magnetic field, to align the spin dipoles. Okay? So this is my poem. It's very boring, but it's a poem. I'm going to call it art. One, 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 one. It's all information. Okay? And then you take away the magnetic field. Okay? And then the spin will want to be randomized. And in that process, it will absorb vibrational energy from the lattice, which we know as heat. Okay? So this is a process we do every day in my own lab. So I'm an experimental physicist. This process is called magnetic cooling. So we use uh, magnetic refrigerators to cool things to a small fraction of a Kelvin. So if you want to cool something to 0.1 Kelvin above absolute zero, uh, you get something called adiabatic demagnetization refrigerator. Adiabatic means this whole thing is insulated from heat. Demagnetization means you apply the magnetic field first, then you take away the magnetic field, and then it cools. Okay, so this is called an ADR. You can look it up. Okay, and it's you know this is how information can be physical. Another example. If you want to realize something that has information, that has digits, that has bits, um, then it will have physical effects. Okay. Um, so the history of entropy is kind of interesting. So physicists invented a macro concept of entropy to largely to describe a lot of phenomena in physics that are irreversible. Okay, so this is uh, this doesn't have copyrights. I just saw it from the internet, so that's some sources. So this is some precious image from the internet. Somebody's on, you know, on party desks. Uh, but in physics, as you know, in the real world, entropy like to increase. You know, the tidy desk will become bad. You know, kind of naturally, it's harder to go from there to there. It will be unnatural. Uh, this is known as the second law of thermodynamics, right? Um, and the concept of entropy was invented uh, to describe that. So, this is the most mathematical side. Um, just show you the identical formulas uh, for entropy uh, in thermodynamics and in information theory, okay? <clears throat> so what happens is, if you have a bunch of processes a uh, bunch of states, and the probability of each one is p, okay? And you can define a quantity uh, that is the sum of p multiplied by log p, okay? This is basically the, a weighted sum of, uh, of log p by the probability, and you have add negative sign, that's what we call entropy, both in physics uh, and in information theory. Okay. So more or less, so in a lot of cases in physics, okay, um, these microstates, these little states, have uh, identical probabilities, okay? So if you have n of these microstates, you plug n into p, because if you, n, if you have n you know, equally likely microstates, the probability of each what happening is one over n, okay? So you plug n into there, 
of satin and you sum it over n times, n cancel uh, p because p is one over n, this goes away and this becomes one over n, which is n to the minus one power, that negative sign cancels with that one, it becomes this. Okay? This is like silly math, but it's so important that, you know, this fellow, uh, Ludwig uh, Boltzmann, inscribed that formula on his tombstone. You heard about this? Okay. It's also unfortunate that he committed suicide at 40 uh, because nobody believed his theory. And he has a mental illness. Okay? Uh, but it, this is a huge deal in physics. So the concept of entropy was invented 25 years before he came up with this formula in a, in a more mathematical, you know, empirical sense, okay, to describe how you mix hot water with cold water and this, some of the entropy of the new system is now larger than the entropy of the cold and hot water, and that describes the second law of the thermodynamics, entropy increases. And he was brilliant in describing that mixing, that increase of entropy in terms of microphysics. He figured out why on a molecular level, okay? Uh, by assigning probabilities to each microstate and just count up the number of microstates that correspond to a macrostate, okay? Mixed warm water and uh, was more or less successful in explaining why uh, entropy tends to increase. Okay. All right. So conceptually, entropy in physics measures randomness with the number of microstates uh, in the simplest case, where Boltzmann. Yeah. Can you maybe give an example of what you mean by a microstate? Yes, I'll give you an example in a minute. Sorry. And it was invented to quantify the previously invented concept of the entropy that was invented in turn to describe irreversible thermal processes. Okay, so I know more about this than this, but I'm going to describe what I understood in the past week when I was reading about this. So conceptually, this quantity measures the amount of incompressible information content of data. Again, if, uh, if your data is one 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 all the way, it's easily compressible to be, I have 50 ones. Right? So your 50 you know, digits become a sentence. I have 50 ones later, right? But if it's 50 random numbers, then you can't compress that. And the probability of that is equal, then you can't compress that. You know, that uh, will maximize this quantity of entropy uh, defined by Shannon, okay? So as far as I know, there is no second law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics in this uh, Shannon entropy, nor the concept of, of temperature, okay, in Shannon entropy. But if you're smart, you can think about the deep links. But as far as I know, nobody came up with the connection quite yet. Okay. Um, yes. So this is an example of uh, macro state versus micro state. Say you say you just toss two dice. And, um, and you're just comparing the results in a bet, right? So the end result that matters is the sum, right, of the face value. <clears throat> and um, of course, you know, it goes from two to 12, okay? So I'm gonna call the sum the macro state because that's the, the end result that matters, right? That determines whether you win or lose, right? And, but the microstates are these, you know, individual combinations of, of the dice values, okay? So just by looking at this table, you know, it's much easier to get seven than two or 12, because this macrostate of seven, sum of seven, uh, corresponds to one, two, seven, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, microstates. So, the probability of having this is six times that of the uh, probability of having two or uh, no. So this is a binomial, a binomial distribution, a binomial distribution, basically. Okay? Um, so this is what I mean by microstates versus macrostates. Any questions so far? Should be very straightforward. Okay. So in physics, 
it's exactly the same. It's just a little more complicated. Physicists try to prove this math, just like computer scientists, right? So that's crazy stuff. Um, so a cold block of solid uh, brought in contact with the hot block of solid. Okay, and you can calculate the number of microstates corresponding to cold cold block. So the atoms are moving around, and the atoms are moving around even more violently in the cold in the hot block. Um, and then you brought the two in contact, and you know heat get transferred from that way to this way, and the two is mixed up, and they all the molecules are mo all moving at a more medium speed. Yeah. So if you count up the number of microstates you realize this thing has way more uh, possible combinations to make it look like this, okay, than the original state. So the entropy increases from this to this, okay? And both in terms of the uh, classical uh, phenomenological description of entropy uh, invented in 1850 uh, by a few French uh, physicists, and also by Bozeman, who came up with the exact formula that link thermodynamics with statistics, statistical mechanics. So far so good, um, but I wouldn't be giving this talk if it were this easy, right? <laughs> but this is probably the part that you've heard of, uh, or probably learned about. How many of you have taken uh, physics uh, 20 series or physics? 20? 20 series or 40, 20 or 40, okay. So this is probably what you talked about, what the lecture talked about, or what you deal with. Yes? Or will be dealing with uh, in the future. Sorry. Yes. And here, uh, the entropy of the warm water, the, sta the warm yes. state, is obviously more than the cold one. But it, it's, it's more than the sum of these. It's more than the sum. It's That's the thing. It's more than the, the sum thing. of these. Yes, it's more than the sum of these. So it's impossible or probabil <laughs> probabilistically unfavorable, crazy word, but uh, for this to spontaneously develop a cold block here and a hotter block here, even though it satisfies energy conservation, but it's just extremely unlikely for that to happen spontaneously, even though it violates no energy cons uh, conservation laws, but it just won't happen from a statistical point of view, right? because uh, that state has way fewer microstates. So if you believe this, the number of microstate is corresponds to probability, uh, as Boltzmann realized, okay? So then if you naturally uh, explain that phenomena that we know of. All right. Now, it comes to surprise, okay? Um, however, just within a few years of this proposal, uh, Bozeman's proposal, a, uh, I think a Dutch physicist uh, came up with a counter argument. This is not well known at all. This is not well known. In fact, I knew about this only after I turned 30, okay? So, so I, I, I learned about this, of course, in high school, but also in college, you know, in a PhD program in Berkeley, not as good as Stanford, but it's still. <laughs> it's good. But um, but nobody told me about anything beyond what I just told told you. Nobody connect this with Big Bang. How would you? How do you connect this with Big Bang? Right. Um, and indeed, this counter argument was proposed a few years after Bozeman, but then quickly forgotten. Okay, until 1980 was brought up again. I guess physicists were busy doing general relativity first, doing quantum mechanics, and the field theory, the <coughs> model, you know, atom smashers, all of that, and they forgot about thermodynamics. Okay. So it's not a coincidence that the person who reproposed this puzzle was Roger Penrose, who of course worked with Stephen Hawking on black holes. Okay? And this is in 1980, so after you know all the theory of black holes, uh, which were around 1970. Okay. So the current argument goes as follows. So in microphysics, um, 
many laws. In fact, nearly all of the laws, right? you can just, for all intents and purposes, you can just think of all laws of, uh, of physics uh, have something called time reversal symmetry. What does it mean? It means if you play a movie of a dynamic, you know, dynamical process, forward or backward, uh, both should satisfy the laws of physics. So this molecule bounces like this, it satisfies the laws of physics, and conservation, momentum conservation, and so on. But the same works if it's going in the reverse direction, if you just play the movie backwards. Okay, so the two molecules collide with each other. If you play the movie backwards, okay, it still satisfies the laws of physics. In other words, uh, in the realm of microphysics, you can play, you know, there's time reversal symmetry. You play the movie backwards, forward, you, sh you shouldn't see any difference. So that's true for mechanical systems, electromagnetism, and particles and field effects, fancy particles, okay? The only, like, extremely, some extremely rare event, okay, violated this, and that's inconsequential uh, to our discussion, okay? And this was known back in, you know, 1875 or 8, okay? So, uh, so the puzzle, the paradox, goes as the following. <clears throat> First, we follow uh, Boseman and Maxwell and Gibbs, so these are the giants of uh, statistical mechanics, okay? So they came up with uh, entropy, you know, explanation, the laws, of, uh, laws of thermodynamics, and so on, okay? And again, I ju I'm just going to review what I just told you. Um, say, a snapshot of, um, of a physical process, you know, what is this? This is an enclosure, this is a chamber. Uh, so it has molecules, air molecules in it. And it just happens for whatever reason, okay? We're going to try to figure it out, okay? For whatever reason, what do you notice about this, these molecules? Do they look normal? Okay, so they're all on the left-hand side of the chamber, okay? And we now thinking, about what happened. You probably know what happened. You know, there was a, there was a wall here and you just took it away, something like that, right? Okay, but forget about that part. You just, this is a state you're given. You're trying to predict what will happen next. Um, you just, empirically, you know what will happen. You know, those molecules will go ahead and fill the entire space uh, in the chamber, right? Um, there is thermodynamics explanation for that. There is also, and it has nothing to do with energy conservation, right? Because, you know, no energy exchange has happened, okay? This is a closed system. Um, so it must have something to do with statistics or entropy. And using the language we just learned, this particular macro state of molecules filling up the entire volume this macro state corresponds to many, many more micro states. Okay, um, it's a bit hard to, to, to explain why, um, but you can just like space. The amount of space available uh, counts as uh, a micro state. So in physics, space and momentum, okay, uh, and the product of the two uh, is the element of microphysics of micro state, if you will. Okay, you know. I can just tell you, this one corresponds to many more microstates than this one. So in terms of probability, in terms of statistics, this is like overwhelmingly more likely to happen than this. So naturally, this will evolve to that, right? So far so good, this is what Boltzmann thought, okay? But then I'm going to ask you to predict how does this uh, happen? How did this happen? Wait, I just used the same argument that I just gave you. You know, in terms of prob probability, we want to find something that has as many microstates as possible. 
because we're trying to predict something, right? And here we're trying to predict the future, and here we're trying to predict the past. So what's, what's the difference between the two? Nothing, because the laws of microphysics are the same, forward and backwards. If you want to predict the future, you can predict the past. So, so the, this is the big problem, right? So, you know, Boseman, you know, Maxwell, Gibbs, these are geniuses, but they failed to realize this. Or in fact, they didn't emphasize this. This was known as a, a luscious paradox. Okay, so this is a, a buzz of only a few years after um, after Maxwell, uh, after Boltzmann. Okay, and as far as I can tell, Gibbs just de-emphasized. You know, or, or even, I don't know if, if he even mentioned this in his textbooks. So he produced these giant textbooks for his cell mechanics, which were then generalized to quantum mechanics and studied by students in the 20th century. Uh, but I don't know if there were any discussions about this particular paradox, which is so elementary, right? You predict about the future, you said this will likely evolve into this. I just twist my words a bit. You predict about the past, you said this is mostly, most likely coming from this. Okay, so all of a sudden, you're predicting that this spontaneously evolved into this. Okay, so this is the big mental block. So I will pause for a minute for you to object. So why are you saying it's a, it's a paradox? Uh, because this says, this seems to be saying, you, you know, you are relying on entropy being a statistical measure to predict the future evolution. But as long as you have this complete symmetry of microphysics, you can use the same argument to predict the past, and the conclusion is observed. The conclusion is, this came overwhelmingly likely, I'm just borrowing my own words, I said this overwhelmingly likely will evolve into that. I said overwhelmingly likely this came from this, which of course violates our everyday experience by a long shot. Yeah, violates our experience, but it doesn't violate the core. Right, right, right. Uh, okay, that we but, the, <laughs> but the whole point of this invention was to explain why your desk go from here to here? Why, uh, why this evolves to that? And why this evolves to that? Now, Mr. Lodgman said, you can't do that. Because using the same argument, you will say, you know, this spontaneously will spontaneously evolve into like this being hot, this being cold. If you just turn the time backwards. Okay? And like I said, people forgot about this, okay? So he objected, and people tried to fix it, they, they wouldn't. But then uh, all the other excitement happens in you know in physics, right? You know, radioactivity, relativity. Uh, quantum mechanics, uh, tremendously, tremendously successful of uh, molecular uh, kinetic model. Okay, so this seems to be like ah, this, something's wrong with this, but I don't, I don't want to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I somehow I understand what you're saying in the previous slide. Uh, in the previous slide, that basically that yeah. picture should be invertible. No, the previous one where. Uh, the atoms, or they, right. they were moving in one direction, or they yes. could do the same. Right, right, right. But I don't see like is that is that argument immediately applicable to the first part of this picture here? Because isn't it isn't it true that when the when the atoms are only in one part of the thing, then you have higher pressure somehow? Maybe I don't see the connection of the previous. Reversibility. Yeah, let me try to refer, re rephrase this. <clears throat> so the whole point of the entropy concept was invented to allegedly to explain the error of time. Like how come you know we tend to have irreversible 
phenomena. I see. But then you have to explain why time has a preferential direction, but not the other way. Because using the same argument, you would seem to predict that, you know, if you just play this movie backward, uh, you are overwhelmingly likely to get this. Okay. So, but speaking of overwhelmingly likely, yes. Right. You are overwhelmingly unlikely to ever observe this kind of scenario. No, no, no. By experience, we didn't do that. We didn't see that. So this is just a hypothetical right. thought. Right. Right. Uh, but this hypothetical experience. scenario is, is overwhelmingly unlikely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this didn't happen. This didn't happen. In fact, we see this, right? Okay? In fact, we see this. If you see something like this, either you just remove a wall just before you take the picture, or this came from like this, right? But using the entropy argument, you say, no, this, is, this has even fewer microstates. So I'm going to favor this. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? You say, well, no, this is more likely. Yeah, but yes, this is indeed what we observe. So this is what we observe. Our universe looks like this. Entropy just increases in one direction. So uh, from order to disorder. And I mean, who can argue with this, right? Nobody sees this coming back into the folate and you know, milking coffee becomes coffee and milk or ice water, you know, warm water spontaneously becomes like ice, floating on top and hot water. Yeah. Just to clarify, so um, I understand stuff like that. So basically you're saying if you look for microstates, you create a movie backwards. Right. It should obey like the laws of physics and it should, and basically you're saying like entropy is one of those laws of physics that it should obey, but in observation. Yeah, so you so can't that, use yeah. statistics to cheat. Because once you do that, I'm going to say you apply it to the past, see mm -hmm. what happens, and all of a sudden, that house of cards is just broke apart. Right. Okay. Um, again, this was observed, this was then ignored, okay, for 100 years, until 1980, when it was reproposed by Roger, Blaine, uh, Roger uh, Penrose. Okay. So far so good? Okay. Now, big surprise. Okay, so summary, summary. So our universe shows a clear error of time, okay? And because of time reversal symmetry in microphysics, the presence of error of time cannot be explained by a superficial probabilistic argument, like the one proposed by the giants of physicists, of physics, okay? So the surprising answer to this puzzle is, was proposed in 1980 by um, Penrose, was that we inherited the order or the low entropy state from the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, Big Bang created an extremely unlikely, extremely special low entropy state with a lot of order. And we're in the process of evolving to the norm of high entropy thermalized state, if you will. Okay, so that's the explanation here. Okay, so let me break that uh, down a bit more. Okay, or, or just to show you, uh, this, is, this has connections um, to one other interesting argument that you come across sometimes. Okay, so the argument goes the following. So we know the second law of thermodynamics tend to uh, increase the entropy, tend to have the entropy increasing, tend to have, if you just let things evolve, things will go from order state to disorder. Right? And yet, you have the Earth born out of you know, the cosmos or whatever claimed by astronomers like you guys, right? And just let it evolve for four and a half billion years. And this is what we had. We had the iPhones. You know, nobody can dispute that this is a highly ordered state with extremely low entropy, with highly complicated programs uh, written in here, with uh, you know all the touch streams, you know, completely aligned. Extremely high, highly ordered state, 
Very, very low entropy. I hope. The most complicated and also most expensive machines human ever built showed up on Earth spontaneously, allegedly, if, you know, if there's no intervention there. And then the DNAs, you know, that we all have, and it has you know, complicated long chains of code, and supposedly this produced a human being giving a lecture here with things that I still remember, right? These all seem very bizarre, like, how can these, you know, highly unnatural, seem highly ordered state spontaneously happen on Earth when you just let it evolve? So, to answer that question, I want to point out something that's less obvious. I'm going to say, again, you're not going to have heard about this. This is also a highly ordered state. Not less than this one. A bit less, to be honest. But this is still a highly ordered state, our solar system. Let me just give you the answer before I go to the punchline, okay? And so is this. So is this, or this, the galaxy. I'm an astronomer, I'm an astrophysicist, that's what I do. Um, so that solar system is somewhere in the air, in the spiral galaxy, self-gravitating, uh, is going around, you know, under gravity. I'm going to claim this is also a highly ordered state. Okay? You know, I'll tell you why later. And so is this, I'm going to tell you, this, our universe, made of galaxies, so each one of these smudge, this is a picture of Hubble Space Telescope, by the way. Uh, this is what your you know, parents paid to build. So you should know more about this. <laughs> <laughs> Taxpayer money. Um, so each one of these is a galaxy, like our own, okay? So it's 100,000, 80,000 80, light years across, so light takes 100,000 years to go from one end to the other. And each one of these smudge, smudges is that. It is something that looks like that. I'm going to say that this, in other words, our universe, okay, is just as special as iPhones and you know <laughs> Atlas, you know, LFC, LFC machines and DNAs that I just showed you. Why is that? Because again, so this is the part that Penrose. What Penrose realized, Penrose is just a mathematician. Yeah, he visited at Stanford all the time, by the way. He's now 85, and he gives a lot of lectures here. Pen Penrose realized that astronomical systems, uh, self gravitating astronomical systems, can always collapse, contract, and release potential energy as heat, which will increase the overall entropy. So, the puzzle, the, the big specialty here, the special things about this is that gravity only attracts, okay, on large, yeah. Is, is that um, increasing overall entropy of the universe? The entire system or of the, the entire system. Of the entire system. Because it would be, if it releases it, it would be releasing. Yes, yes, yes. So this is a picture of the globular cluster. <clears throat> um, for this to lose entropy, to, to, to Sorry, to, to uh, gain entropy, I should say. To gain entropy, it just collapses, because this is all gravity. Gravity only attracts, right? You just collect all of that. So collapsing this from this to this, you have a lot of extra potential energy. <clears throat> so you're right, potential energy is negative, right? So this has more negative potential energy. So going from here to here, you gain energy. And all of that energy is in the form of kinetic energy now, kinetic motion now. And all of that kinetic motion becomes heat. And then that heat gets radiated away eventually. So now the overall entropy has increased by a lot. So the process can repeat and repeat, and the entropy of the system just gets larger and larger. There's no end. Until this becomes yes. So when this becomes black hole, you can calculate the entropy of a black hole that Patrick talked about. And it's enormous compared to a uh, state like this. So this is how gravitational system just keep getting entropy all the time, just by collapsing into black holes. And two black holes merging 
into one, you get even more entropy. Just like hot water, cold water, brought together, you get more entropy. Okay? So you can just, this, this is just endless. Okay? So remember, where, 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 where did our sun come from? It came from a diffuse interstellar medium, you know, thousands of light years across. Okay? So just let it evolve. It like to collapse because gravity uh, is an attractive force only. Collapses, collapses, releasing potential energy into heat. So this glows. So you say, oh, the sun is glowing only because of the nuclear uh, fusion. Wrong. It was glowing it was before the nuclear fusion started. It was glowing from all the heat that get converted from potential energy uh, into heat. Okay? So this was in uh, Emperor's New Mind, I believe. This is the Raja Kendall's book. <clears throat> so how do we get all the order? iPhone, DNAs, people, sheeps, you know, on Earth. How do we get all of this order? That order was inherited from this massive diffuse interstellar cloud because this is a very highly unnatural state for gravitational gravitational system to be in. Gravitational systems like to be black holes because those things have largest entropy. So this is highly unnatural. This collapses into stars, and we have one of those in our solar system. It's called the sun, right? <clears throat> Gives off short wavelength radiation, which represents highly ordered form of entropy, of energy. So you know photons have energy. A gamma ray photon can have the same amount of energy as you know, radio wave, if there's enough radio wave, right? But a gamma ray photon is a much more ordered form of energy than thermal radiation, infrared, radio, okay? But the sun gives us order, highly order form, short wavelength, you know, ultraviolet, you know, radiation, invisible wavelength radiation, and the earth gives back infrared radiation as waste heat. This thermal radiation from the Earth at 300 Kelvin. The sun is sitting at 6,000 Kelvin, so that wavelength is a lot shorter, and the Earth gives back, you know, just useless waste heat. So this becomes an engine, okay? So all the order that we see and experience on Earth comes from the short wavelengthness of the sun, of the sunlight. So we receive the order. We receive low, low energy, a low entropy state from the sun. And the sun received that from interstellar medium, diffusely distributed, because this is not the natural state. So it has a lot of order in it. And that received it from total galaxies. You know? And that received it from the universe. Yes? Yeah, so yeah, let, let, let me spend a little. Right. So, as long as the total entropy of the system, including the sun, increases, you have no, nothing to worry about in terms of second law of thermodynamics, right? So, a bunch of people who advocate for intelligent design, to be, to be frank here, um, said, you know, the only reason you have this order on Earth is through divine intervention. Right? Because how, how can you have the iPhone? If you just let Earth evolve, things will just turn to chaos. But in fact, they're ignoring that we're receiving order, this highly ordered energy uh, uh, format from the sun. Okay? So this is just a. And the total entropy increases because of this useless waste heat, has a lot of entropy. Okay? These two combined get this. You can have a bit more order. That's fine because there's a lot of a lot more disorder getting released back. Okay. So why did I say this is Big Bang? Because Big Bang gives us 
a uniformly distributed uh, space filled with matter. And that's highly un unnatural. If Big Bang just gave us black holes and nothing else, then it's natural. But instead, Big Bang gave us this uniformly distributed matter and just let it evolve under gravity. And when you have slight over density in some places, just like capitalism, <laughs> it attracts even more money or mass around to make even more massive objects. Okay, because gravity only attracts, right? Um, Want to see the movie again? So initially we have uniformly distributed matter. With a bit of noise, so that noise part is interesting, but I have no time to tell you about that noise. So this is what I do for a living. So I do, I, what I do for a living is to measure that noise. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. So this is this represents one over the size of the universe. Okay. So we're, we're looks like the box didn't change its size, but because we were just zooming out. Okay. Because the universe is actually expanding, right? We're just zooming out. And this represents the size of the universe, one over the size of the universe. So z of 30 being the size of the universe was one thirtieth of its current size. Okay. Roughly speaking. So entropy is increasing, 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 increasing. And this is our universe now. This is computer simulation. It looks just like ours. You can just do the statistical measurements, it looks, it's, all the properties are the same. And that universe looks like this. And then what happens, then there are a bunch of stars, uh, like our own sun, and so on. And what happened to these stars? Well, all these stars, depending on their masses, uh, they end up in one of these remnants. So you don't have enough mass, you can live forever at this ground door. Uh, if you have one solar mass, like our sun, then it's gonna become a red giant, burning all the you know, lives around it, like us. And then it becomes planetary nebula, and then the cooling gradually as white dwarfs. If you have more mass, then it's more exciting, it blew up. It blows up as uh, supernovae. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and leaving neutron stars. And then it'll just cool off gradually. So all of these just cool up gradually, okay? And then if you have even more mass, then it turns into black holes. Now it gets interesting, because black holes cannot go to and go back. So we heard about black holes. They, they're, they were from matter, but they, can't, they couldn't go back to being matter, because nothing can escape from it. So it, it, it'll just remain as just permanent warpage of space-time, if you will. So it can't go back, that means if you just go stop at it, uh, the black holes just grow, okay? So once you have black holes, it'll just run into the stuff, it'll just absorb interstellar medium, it'll just absorb stars, and it'll just form bigger, bigger black holes. And in fact, one of, we have one of those super, what we call supermassive black holes in the center of our galaxy, like right here does from this gravitational collapse, you know, the supernova explosion, and they just merge and merge, and they became uh, larger and larger black holes. Yeah? So the image, the, the paradox that you said before, um, with the past part, yes. um, the, like, smaller, or, like, the smaller organization of particles can still exist, and that can still be more entropy, because it can radiate, uh, it could have radiated heat, like, isn't that... What you're saying? Uh, no, no. Let, 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 let me try to finish the, the next slide and go back to your question if you still have a question. Okay. Um, so I'm just trying to finish up the description of the evolution here. So you have black holes and it's going to suck up stuff. And uh, eventually, like a super long time scale, it's going to turn everything into black holes. And thermodynamically, that's when everybody's happy, when you know, entropy is high, and, you know, it's equilibrium. Right? Of course, this is a very different universe than what we are familiar with. But in terms of physics, that's a more natural thermal uh, universe in equilibrium. 
and we are living in a very, very special universe. Not only because we have all this stuff, but it's related to what, why we have all this stuff, okay? And that order came from this initial condition. So can you imagine this was only realized in 1980? Okay. Um, so this is even more evidence of that picture. So this is, um, so Patrick showed you this, right? This is a detection of uh, two black holes merging into one. If you, if you just calculate the entropy, yeah, it increased. The entropy increased. The surface area, which represents the amount of entropy of black hole, increased just by merging. And this was an incredible uh, technological uh, miracle uh, for this to happen. Uh, it was from Nobel Prize and website. Okay, this is a grand summary. The reason we're seeing an error of time, okay, is because we're still pretty close to something special here. Because we inherited something that's really special, that has a lot of order to the beginning, and we're just seeing the effect of that. That's very different from the universe filled with black holes. And physically, that's what's going to happen. The universe is definitely moving in that direction. Okay? But we don't we never see black holes turning back into molecules, even into qubit. Just just like um, just like all the other thermodynamic examples. Okay. So now you're gonna ask, what exactly happened here? Right? So good does that answer your question? So now the big question becomes, um, what exactly happened here? And 95% of good physicists uh, will tell you it's inflation. Okay? So what happens is um, our Big Bang universe, okay? starting out in a hot condensed state to a vast old state like we're on our own now, okay? Our universe is one of many bubbles. This, is, this picture is in particular called chaotic inflation, okay? And what we know as the beginning of everything of our universe is really just a branching point, okay? It's when this particular bubble started. So, of course, the inflation theory, okay, which agrees with all known physics, you know, relativity and all of that, were designed to explain other puzzles. But a very natural consequence of that is uh, that universe is that the universe can just the universes can just spontaneously uh, happen, okay, uh, just by chance. And if you don't there's no universe, and then there's no universe, but when it happens, it'll have certain properties, okay? And um, we kind of push, and that inflationary mechanism naturally gives you this initial condition, okay? So there are a bunch of properties about this initial condition uh, that inflation can just naturally explain from dynamics point of view. So if gravity is pulling everything together, right. and like we're moving forward in a way of like where there'll be lots of black holes, like if everything is pulling together, how is the universe expanding? Right. So for example, gravity is pulling everything down, but yet this thing was moving up for a while. So you just need that initial kick. As long as it was slowing down, everything was fine, right? Because it decelerated. Mm -hmm. Now our universe doesn't work quite like that. Okay, up until 1997, that was the correct uh, picture. But after 1997, we realized that the expansion of the universe was in fact accelerating. So forget about what I just <laughs> showed you. Okay, but I'm just sh t telling you, it is possible for a uh, system to be expanding while it has contracted force, as long as you have the initial case. 
a bomb and just fly off. And inflation is that explosion mechanism, so to speak. <clears throat> okay. So, in like expansion, like dark energy and stuff like that, does, right. does dark energy come in other things like that too? I don't know. Yeah, I don't. So far, my lecture involved no dark energy until just now, right? Just the accept accelerated expansion of the universe. And also, uh, this. <coughs> the act of inflation uh, is very similar to dark energy. The description of that is very similar to dark energy. It's just push, pushing everything out. Uh, so this is, uh, again, described perfectly well in general relativity. Okay, so this is an attempt to make sense of the initial condition that we are inherited from, the Big, big, big Bang, what we call Big Bang. Let's say this is our universe, what we call Big Bang. And um, you can argue about the naturalness, how easy it is to create these universes. But as long as space and time is infinite, it is in this picture, right? So it goes on in forever. We can have multiple universes. This is a multiverse picture, if you will, a bubble universes picture. Then, you know, even though it's unlikely for something to happen, it can still happen. And if you have no observer to observe nothingness, then what are you complaining about? So whatever you observe <laughs> must have a universe in it. It must be observed from the universe, okay? Um, but th that explanation is controversial. People are still trying to make sense of uh, whether the statement, chaotic inflation, actually made the beginning more natural, okay? Because uh, uh, after all, we realized Big Bang was very special. It created a very special initial condition uh, and you don't want to just just hand wave, okay, and say, hey, you know, because we're here, we know it exists, you know, it seems a bit unsatisfactory to a lot of people. Does this also mean our universe can give rise to other universes via? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's possible. So, um, in fact, because we don't quite understand what exactly happened here, um, you know, there, there are people speculating uh, that, for example, a crazy person tried to stop LHC, the CERN accelerator, from colliding particles. They say, oh, you physicists don't, don't know what you're doing. You're going to destroy the universe, not just the Earth, because you're going to create another Big Bang just by colliding particles. Okay, because, you know, in fact, you know, we don't understand exactly what happened here. Uh, but, you know, we use other arguments to shut down the guy so that they can still any questions so far? So is this chaotic inflation, is this like some kind of a mathematical theory? Like how is this just a, at what, like how developed this is? Like so the calculation was entirely done in general relativity, which is very well established and verified over and over and over and over again in calculations like this, okay? But what's unclear <clears throat> is whether there is such a field that generates that reaction. Once you assume there is such a field and you just plug that field into the calculation, this comes out. This initial condition comes out. And you just let gravity evolve it would generate galaxies and planets and order on Earth, like we were discussing. So is there no room here to um, incorporate quantum effects? Yes, there is. Huge. And that's the part that I didn't know whether I had time for. But it looks like I might have a few minutes to talk about that. But I want to finish the classical part. Which is... Uh, That's the solar picture. <clears throat> and uh, of course, this picture was only clear after the discovery of, uh, theoretical discovery of black hole entropy in the 1970s. Okay? Okay. 
quantum. So you're going to ask, what about that initial noise? Without that initial noise, you have perfectly dilute materials, gas, uniformly distributed in the universe. It'll evolve into a even more diluted, larger universe, also uniformly distributed. Okay, so I said, you know, we need initial over density, under density, so the rich people can steal from the poor people, right? But if you don't have that inequality to begin with, then everybody will be equal, will stay equal uh, in, uh, in gravity, of the gravity. So you need that initial fluctuation in density to create structures, galaxies, planets, and people. <clears throat> this is where my work comes in. Yeah, like I said, I study that fluctuation for a minute. Okay? So as far as we know, that fluctuation came from quantum mechanics. Okay? So if you just plug quantum mechanics into the inflationary process described by general relativity, you get this fluctuation right away out of the equation. It's a very elementary calculation. Okay? And you get that right away. Okay? So this fluctuation is just super interesting, right? So this fluctuation, without this, you're not going to have any structures. You're not going to have galaxies, you know, clusters of galaxies. And it combines quantum mechanics with general relativity, the two biggest pillars uh, of uh, modern physics. Okay. Um, so it's a bit hard to explain to you exactly how uh, fluctuation is created, but it has something to do with Hawking radiation, you can think of it this way. So on Tuesday, we, uh, Patrick Hayden talked about Hawking fluctuation, uh, Hawking radiation, having a horizon, and that or, um, a thermal radiation will be coming out of the surface of that horizon. In inflation, during inflation, there is a different type of horizon getting created, and from the surface of that horizon, another form of fluctuation or radiation uh, gets generated uh, in thermal form. And it eventually becomes um, that fuzz, that noise. Okay. So I have a few more slides to show you what it looks like. This is the actual data. This is the actual data. I didn't just make this, <laughs> okay. This is a billion dollar uh, European sally, satellite. Uh, that was cloned. Um, it was launched in 2010, I believe. <clears throat> uh, so it measures the temperature of the sky precisely in all directions, and they fly like this. So what what are we looking at? So this is this shows temperature fluctuation. And this is directly measuring that density fluctuation that I told you about to be required to create any structures, seeds of structure formation, and also seeds play put in by quantum fluctuation, quantum mechanics, okay? But what, what are we actually looking at here? What's, what's this temperature? So this goes to, uh, let me ask how many slides. Okay. Um, so this is that big bang, okay. Bang, and then we have our bubble universe, right? <clears throat> so everything was expanding, cooling. What's the universe made of? Particles. Atoms, right? So now we have galaxies, atoms, and so on. But back in the days, you know, it was much hotter and it was much more dense, right? Because the universe was smaller. Okay, so it was hotter, it was denser, to a point where you can no longer have atoms. So beyond a certain point, earlier enough, early enough, you only have plasmas. All the atoms, all the electrons couldn't be um, bound to uh, the uh, nuclei anymore. So they got stripped away, you know, in kind of universal sense, okay? So beyond this point, everything was ionized to its con constituents. After this point, um, everything became the stuff we know, atoms, normal atoms, okay? It's just natural heat will just ionize all this stuff. So this looks like the surface of plasma, like the sun. The sun is the plasma ball 
and it's not, you, you can't see inside it because there's so much photon scattering uh, once you have charged particles. So the universe became plasma at a certain point if you look farther back enough. When did that happen? It happened at about 300 or 400,000 years after Big Bang. And where is it? It's everywhere, right? Because in astrophysics, there's a look back time effect, right? You look at the moon, you see it as it was 1.3 seconds ago. You look at the sun, you see it as it was eight minutes ago. You look at Uranus, it was two hours ago, because it took, took time for light to travel. You look at Andromeda Galaxy, you know, you were looking at it when, as it was three million years ago, and that was the most nearest galaxy three million years ago. So look anywhere, in any direction, far enough, you're going to reach the beginning, not the end of the universe. You're going to reach the beginning of the universe because it's a look back time event, and because the universe has a finite age. So this radiation represents the beginning of the universe and it's in all directions. So just look in all directions and measure the temperature, you're going to measure the initial density fluctuation of the universe when it was only 300,000 years old. And you said we can't see beyond that, right? Can't see beyond that with photons. You could see beyond that with other stuff. And that's what I really do for a living, but I have no time to tell you about that. Okay? So look in every, any direction, you hit this firewall, uh, it's known as the cosmic microwave background radiation, and you measure the fluctuation, the temperature fluctuation of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, you see something like this. So you see fluctuations of uh, tens of microcalories. Okay. And you can study the properties of the uh, Earth universe as it was oscillated uh, and so on. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, this is all real. <laughs> Why is that? I've been measuring this since, uh, since I was in Berkeley uh, as a grad student. Uh, so we built our instrument in our labs. We take it to the South Pole. Yes, I have experimented at the South Pole, I still do. Uh, and we measure the sky. And we can see, you know, we can't see the entire sky because the Earth is in the way. You can only do this measurement when you're out in the orbit, right? Uh, and you can just measure a small patch and just compare it with a Planck measure and it's completely the same. And we can do the measurement in a few hours now. Okay. Why do you go to the South Pole for these measurements? Uh, because what happens is this radiation, uh, this thermal radiation, okay, which represents the ionization energy of hydrogen atoms, okay, uh, or a few thousand Kelvin. Uh, gets rest shifted, all the photons get stretched out uh, to microwave radiation. So microwaves get easily absorbed by water. So you want to go to the driest place on Earth, which turned out to be South Pole, because all of that water vapor is frozen on the ground. It's, it's the ice shelf. South Pole. Yes. South Pole. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, South Pole turned out to be the biggest desert, the driest desert on Earth. So it just collapsed all of that water uh, into a column. Uh, you have uh, 0.2 millimeter worth of water. If you do that here, right now you probably get you know five meters <laughs> because it's actually raining. But even if, when it was not raining, uh, you get 10 centimeters of water. But at South Pole, it's 0.1 millimeter. So you do these experiments in space or at South Pole or high in the Atacama Desert in Chile. So if I follow. Points is that when you incorporate quantum effects, yeah. um, you realize that there's there's nothing miraculous about there are the nothing of about, about, about the, those. Uh, it's still kind of a mystery if you really want to study what happened, like what gives rise to the initial conditions that gives you a inflation in a chaotic inflation picture. The conditions have to be right, and it's a very active area of research that my colleagues cared about. Okay. And there are people claiming, well, no, we can never do it. It's just as unnatural as without inflation. But I'm gonna say they're wrong. Uh, and inflation is still a great 
picture that you solve a lot of the problems, 90% of the problems, if not all of the problems. So is there anything miraculous about the Earth and life in it? Um, so this is a whole other talk, which actually prepared, but it has nothing to do with information theory or entropy. But I gave that talk. The title of that talk is uh, Our Place in the Universe. As my last lecture, uh, just before Thanksgiving, right here in this classroom, uh, to 50 students. So I'm taking them to observe this planets and galaxies and supernovae and so on. And uh, I also give them lectures to give them background. So in my last lecture, I talked about our position in the universe, in which I talked about um, what's something called Fermi Paradox. Uh, and I talked about the search for extraterrestrial life, uh, and um, just and more anthropic stuff. What do I mean by that? So I just mentioned it very quickly that you know, in order to have an observer uh, in one of these universes, that universe must look like something. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any observers. A very trivial example is, you know, um, our solar system turned out to be stable. So you can say it's a trivial statement or it's a profound statement <laughs> either way. Of course, it's a stable system. Otherwise, how did people evolve from it, from a solar system? It has to be stable for four billion years. Come on, right? But then when you look around at other systems, most planetary systems aren't stable because it has a binary star. Instead of one sun, it has two suns, right? Perturbing the orbit, it's like crazy. Or there's a Jupiter inside of Mercury's orbit, right? It's just craziness, just chaos. In a highly elliptical orbit like Halley Comet. I mean, you can't live in a planetary system like that. But if you looked out, those are the typical planetary systems out there. But we happen to live in a very special uh, planetary system, the solar system, with all the, you know, planets in the circular orbit going in the same way, in not chaotic ways. Uh, and that's not a coincidence, that's a selection effect, that's part of anthropic. And somebody tried to apply that anthropic arguments to universes, which becomes more controversial. So how confident are you that you will eventually discover uh, signs of life <laughs> from other <laughs> sources? So first of all, if this is our galaxy, if this, this is not our galaxy, we can't see our own galaxy you know, in pictures. But if this were another galaxy, forget about all hope of communicating with any other galaxy. So remember, the nearest galaxy to us is Andromeda, and it's three million light years away. So light takes three million years to go from here to here. So forget about coming. Six million years is a long time. Sorry, I don't know. A five year. <laughs> no, but again, what, why is it not realistic to expect that I'll, I'll get signals that suggest that there was so life should, in that galaxy? So in order to have that discussion, like that many years ago. <laughs> in order to have that discussion, I think we have to discuss Fermi paradox, but we don't have time to discuss that. Okay. And just a question, maybe related to that. Uh, so when you do the math, like, is it seems likely that there are other stable uh, g galaxies or like solar, solar system, systems, sorry, system. solar systems, system. or uh, planetary systems, or is, does it turn out to be extremely unlikely, or is there a way to make this kind um, of a back of the envelope? It's not very likely, but it's not crazy unlikely either. <clears throat> For example, if you just look, Google, habitable planets, uh, and you can get a list of a handful. And those planets are known to be in a stable orbit with a long-lived star, and it's just at the right distance away from it to be in a habitable zone when you can have liquid water. 
So we could just move there and do fine if it has that. But, but in terms of temperature, in terms of the availability of water, and in terms of st stability, those plants are just fine. And those are known plants. It, it's not always like that. These plants were just discovered less than 10 years ago. But uh, you can find those. They're not very common. But the reason you can find those is because this is our galaxy, and it has 100 billion stars. So that's why. There's just so many. So even though the probability is small, you can still have many. Okay. So forget about communicating with the Andromeda galaxy or the other galaxy. But within our galaxy, um, according to calculation, uh, you expect anywhere between one around and a million hab habitable planets with civilization on. So I just said nothing, right? Because between one is zero and a million that means many. Um, but that's just how large the uncertainty is. But it's definitely possible that within our galaxy uh, there could be uh, intelligent uh, extraterrestrials. So would the most natural resolution to Fermi's paradox be then that there are, yes, there is life and there is a lot of it, but we just can never communicate with them. That's why we don't see them. Um, no. No? Okay. No. The point of Fermi paradox, which I never mentioned, by the way, let me just quickly say, Fermi paradox says um, the galaxy lived for billions of years already, right? And, um, and, um, it doesn't take that long to colonize the galaxy if we want to. So it takes millions of years. But millions of years is nothing compared to the billions of years it has lived. What do you mean by colonize? So if you just send probes, send probes out. We've already started. Sigma. We already sent two probes out. OK? So if we start sending probes out, like um, some rich guy, Yuri Milner, wanted to send even more. So he put in $100 million and wanted to send more probes out. Okay? So if you want to just send probes around the galaxy. So probably you mean a satellite? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just a probe with like an antenna like or something that explores. Think of it, you know, a robot or something. You know, so what do you mean we sent two? We sent many. Sorry? Why, why are you saying we sent two? That had already gone outside of the solar system. Oh. So we have many that's orbiting the Earth. It's not going anywhere. But we've already sent uh, two or three outside of the solar system. Those will just travel to our galaxy, the rest of our galaxy. So if you start doing that, it doesn't take much uh, to just completely populate the entire galaxy within a million years. Again, a million years seems like a long time, but it's not long at all on cosmic scale. Okay, and yet we haven't found any, you know, you know, avian spaceships or anything, you know, on Earth. So this becomes a puzzle. So if it's so easy, so quickly, on a cosmic time scale, to populate the entire galaxy, why do we have, why do we have a we seen them? Okay? So very, very quickly, the two likely up, uh, explanations are, first of all, it's just possible that we're the only civilization in the galaxy. Okay? Don't believe that. The second possibility is even more disturbing if you don't like the first answer. What is the second explanation? That no one cares to communicate with us. <laughs> well, I, I will say that's the third coming, third possibility, and it's even less than I'm like this. Because it's something very really vain, vain in, in the thought that you know someone wants to send us signals. <laughs> but it's very hard to hide. Do you know we have eight meter telescopes looking at the sky all the time, constantly. It's really hard to hide away from you know technology like that. Okay, so and we haven't seen you know if you don't believe. You want to say something? Oh, you, you, said you want to s speculate. Yeah, the possibility is that they already left. They, they already left. Yeah. Uh, it's really hard to leave the galaxy. Maybe they, they, they just don't. They, 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 they are wrong, but they, 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 they don't let us. us. But like they're again, it's um, hard to yeah, observe us and not to be detected by us at this yeah. point. We are pretty advanced now. So the second possibility yeah. is that they kill themselves once they develop technology. We almost did that. We almost did that. And we're very close. We're very close. There's a doomsday clock, remember? What's the doomsday clock? 
Oh, it's just uh, you know a total 